Okay, now we're ready. Intro to measurement. We're also, so what we're going to do today is uh, I just want to introduce measurement. Introduce the concept of measurement. Introduce the concept of measurement. Talk about the SI system. And talk a little bit about scientific notation. And maybe if we'll see how much time we have, maybe get some practice with that. So we're going to be using scientific notation quite a bit in here. And we need to make sure that you're comfortable with that. So introducing the concept of measurement, did you know that there are people who say, who, who feel like measurement is boring? Or maybe even while I say this, while I say um, introduction to measurement, you're thinking, wow, that's like really basic. What are we, are we, is he actually going to talk about like measuring things? We're going to spend quite a bit of time on measuring because I don't think that measurement is boring. Think about this. I, you know, I was reading this book once a while back and it was called, uh, it's kind of a classic and it's called Great Ideas in Modern Mathematics. And it kind of starts with, I never read the whole book because it was too much for me, but I, the introduction of it was talking about kind of the origins of mathematics and er, very early or primitive math and measurement. And it pointed out that, and I don't know, I had never really thought about it before, but it was like, why, why do we use a base 10 system of numbers? And everybody does, and throughout history, pretty much everybody's used the base 10. Why is that? Why don't we count in base 2? It's easy. But think historically. Think about early, early humans. Why did they decide on a base 10 system? Right, 10 fingers. So what does that tell you? It tells you this, that before there were numbers, there were fingers. So, um, all right, I'll give you mm, acorns for your mm, shells. See what I'm saying? You had to have a way of keeping track of things. And then you can imagine them with some kind of like rudimentary math, like flashing their hands, you know. Before they actually have a, like a written number system, you've got some kind of hand signals or something. Who knows? There's kind of a, do you know that? that giant, well, the Cyclops in the Odyssey, the one that Odysseus blinded because he thrust his spear in the th would they get it drunk or something, right? And then they, then he like gouged the big eyeball out with, the, with his spear. That giant was called Polyphemus. You guys are good. So Polyphemus, they say, used to keep track of his sheep because he was always suspicious that somebody would steal them or whatever. So he used to keep track of them by whenever one would walk through the door of his cave, he would move a rock like from one pile into another or something like that. So that was rudimentary measurement. That was a type of measurement. Now, one thing that um, so let's make a few points here. So measurement is always relative. Now what I mean by that is it is always a comparison. of, say, one object with another. 
or one group. It's always a comparison of one object or group with another. Maybe a group of stones, maybe a group of fingers. How about objects? If I have a meter stick that I'm using to measure length, then I'm comparing things to this meter stick. That's all it is. So when I say something's 100 centimeters long, it just means it's as long as this stick, which is as long as something else. So maybe some standard, what is it? I should have looked this up because I messed this up yesterday too. I think that originally the meter was like 1 ten thousandth of the length of the prime meridian or something like that. And now it's defined as the distance that light can travel in a certain number of picoseconds. All we're doing is comparing two things. But what's the purpose of that? The purpose is twofold. One, to keep track of things and the other to be able to communicate to other people. If we have this standard, we can more easily communicate things with people. Imagine trying to build a house, for example, or more extreme case, a skyscraper, without any standards of measurement. It would be impossible. So these sorts of standards are very important. But I bring up, and we're going to get into this a little bit more later, uh, later on, in this unit. But this idea of measurements being relative, I think, is important to keep in mind. There's nothing, um, and it's even true about mass, for example. A kilogram, a kilogram is just a chunk of platinum or palladium. I'm not exactly sure what metal it's made of under glass in a vault in France. So if you, if you have a mass of 100 kilograms, if your body has a mass of 100 kilograms, it means it, all it means is that you weigh as much as 100 of these standard kilograms, which is sitting, it's this chunk of metal, sitting under glass in a vault in France. It's just comparing things. But again, the purpose is to be able to communicate with other people, to be on the same page with how much of something we have. And this is very important in science because how could science ever progress if we weren't able to communicate our findings with other people? That's what science is about. Different groups passing along knowledge to, to the next. Secondly, second point I want to make is all measurements Our estimates. All measurements are estimates. Except, I'm going to make one exception here. Counts. So if you're counting a small number of objects, So if I'm counting the number of students in this room, I can be exact. There's no uncertainty in that. But every other measurement is going to be an estimate. Why is that? Because picture this. When Polyphemus is sitting at his cave, so here's his cave. Here he is with his eye gouged out. Okay, and he's got his pile of rocks, and his sheep are coming through. Okay, he is, he's able to get an exact number in that case because he doesn't have too many sheep and he knows how many rocks he has exactly. Right, he's probably exact. But take this example. What if he's trying to measure how much, how much milk he gets from his sheep? So he's trying to measure how much milk. And for that, he has a bucket. So what he does is he fills the bucket with milk. So this, the pile of rocks can be exact. He fills the bucket with milk. 
and he sees how many times he can fill it, and then he just counts, right? Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Can he be exact with that measurement? I've got so many buckets of milk exactly. You think? How many people think he could be exact with that? He could be exact with how many buckets of milk he has. How many, think, how many of you think it is possible, conceivable, that he could be exact? Raise your hand. In what case? Somebody tell me. Michaela. Okay. All right. If it was whole buckets, then, so if every bucket was filled right to the top, so he just got lucky, and it turns out he's able to fill up four full buckets, right? But let's zoom in on the bucket. What does exactly full mean? level, exactly level with the top? Or maybe would it come up at all? Or would it be slightly below? What if we zoom in again? Is it really exactly level with the top rim of the bucket? Is there no air blowing across that's making it shift a little bit? Or vibrations that are making it move? Zoom in closer. Is it possible that you could zoom in so close that you could tell that it was exactly lined up with the rim of the bucket? And if you did zoom in that close, would the molecules themselves mess that up and their random motion and make it so that they don't exactly match? Would small fluctuations in the, in the, in the volume of the bucket because of tiny temperature fluctuations make a difference? They would turns out it's impossible. And the, it gets even worse if he's got a half a bucket, because now he's trying to estimate what a half a bucket is. right? But even if they were full, he would have this problem. Now, let's replace Polyphemus with a robot Polyphemus. OK? What do you think now? So this is a robot Polyphemus who has a laser eye. And he can, with that laser eye, he can measure whether it's the level of the milk in the bucket. What do you think? Can he be exact? You say no? Anybody want to defend their position? Leah. Okay, so we're kind of shifting the question there. Now there's some sort of a measurement device that tells how much milk's coming out or going into the bucket, like a like a gas pump. Like stop, like just like get in your bucket every time you push you. Okay, but how does he know? How does the robot know when it's full? But how does it detect it? Does it have a laser? that it's shining and then when the laser gets reflected a certain way you know what I mean and is there is that process of that laser bouncing and going back into the detector is that going to have any uncertainty associated with it there's always going to be something when you're looking at it when you're looking at the bucket what you're doing is light is reflecting off of that back to your eyes. It's hitting your retina, and your brain is making some judgment about um, where that level is, right? So is the robot. It's just that somebody has to program the robot into how to respond to those impulses that are coming in. But it turns out there's still going to be uncertainty. It doesn't matter if he's a robot or not. In fact, it would be hard. It's, it's hard to make a machine that is as good as humans at doing this sort of thing. It's hard to. You can make machines that are more consistent than humans because they're always going to do things the same way as they're programmed. But it's hard to make them that are actually better at making this sort of estimate or judgment. So, and I know some of you don't believe me. 
about the robot. Because I see, I get this all the time from students that they think when they put something on an electronic balance that it's exact. But let me ask you this. Electronic balance. So here's, you've probably all used one of these before, right? I put an object on the pan here and it gives me a readout. So here's my object and it says 10.1 grams. Exactly? No, that's not exact. So this is the robot, folks. This is the robot doing the job. And he's not doing it exactly. He's rounding it to point 0.1 by some process. And I'm not sure how this works, but there's some kind of a way that it's processing the signals coming in. And if the signal is a certain strength, it goes to 10.2. And if it's a certain strength, it stays at 10.1. And in between, it, I don't know how it makes the decision. But it's making that decision, and it's not exact. Because, look, I have another balance. So here's one. We have another balance around here. It's called analytical balance. I don't know if you've seen it before. It has a big glass case on the top with a little sliding door. Have you seen that before? And it has the capability of measuring to the nearest 10,000th of a gram. So maybe this balance gives me this for the same object. Is this exact? No. Do I have more information with this one? Yes. So the idea is when I say that they're all estimates, don't take me to don't take that to mean that we don't know anything about the object. Okay? Just saying that something's an estimate doesn't mean you don't know anything. It might be a really good estimate. We might know a lot about it, but we don't know everything. So we have to start to think about measurements in terms of how confident are we in that measurement. And that's what we're going to do in this class big time. So that's going to be where this class is going to be different than uh, science classes you've had in the past in terms of measurement. We're going to be using the plus or minus notation and things like that to try to tell about how precise we are. By the way, one of these one of these things right here costs about two hundred fifty dollars. This baby right here, fifteen hundred. So it doesn't come cheaply. This that kind of information, getting this kind of this level of precision about something, costs money. And so when you're using these instruments, we want you to give us as much information as you possibly can off that instrument take full advantage of the expenditure. So I think, does this make it, make it clear what I'm saying about nothing being exact? You can, go, you can get balances that will go uh, further than this as well, but they're usually designed a little differently. OK, so, so why is measurement not boring? Why is measurement not boring, in my opinion? Because it is philosophical, in a sense. It's almost like when you're doing measurement, you're like getting involved in this whole philosophical thing about our relationship to the universe. Because when you think about it, this whole estimation process it does get pretty philosophical because you can ask questions like how do we really know things and how much do we know and what is this estimation process that's going on and this process of us making a judgment about things whether it's this or that what's going on in our brains when that's happening how much can we really know about the universe how much can science tell us about the universe these are all questions that are coming up as we're just doing the simple act of making a measurement. And we often take it for granted. Here's another question. The fact that, the, that we can do this is pretty amazing. 
Because I'll tell you what, it is a question of how much we can know. And there are people out there, there are philosophers out there that say you really can't know anything about the universe. I think it's hard to hold that position. When you look at the progress of science and the absolutely amazing things that science has been able to accomplish, even in the past 50 years, especially in the past 50 years, it's really hard to argue with that something's going on here. We're getting something right. You know what I mean? It's hard to take the kind of nihilist position or the relativist position and say, we don't know anything. Because there's some cool things going on. And we're basically, uh, people are basically gaining a mastery over nature that was unimaginable not long ago. And it's kind of hard to imagine that you could get that level of mastery without um, something real going on. So it's, and this is part of this. I mean, measurement is an integral part of science. And so that's why, that's why I say that it's not boring. It is of the essence of science. It's really an essential part. Without it, science would be impossible. We couldn't test a hypothesis without measuring something to test it. The whole birth of science as something new had to do with this. Because think about Aristotle, right, and Plato. They didn't measure anything. They thought they didn't have to. They kind of poo-pooed the idea of worrying about what the world was really like. And they just did everything in their heads. They just reasoned everything. They used logic. And they thought they could, just using logic, they could come up with all the answers. Science didn't take off until people started measuring stuff. Galileo sitting in church, bored out of his skull. Although he could understand the Latin mass. And he's watching the nave lanterns swing on their chains. And he starts measuring the period of the swing against his pulse. And that's how he came up with his ideas. So it was in the act of measurement that he was like, wait a minute here. There is a pattern to this. There's a pattern. And if I can master that pattern, then I can start to control things. If the universe works like kind of clockwork, then, and I figure that out, wow. I have superpowers. And that's really where we're going now. I mean, with, with science now, it's just mind-boggling. Some of the things that are coming down the pike in terms of what we'll be able to do. So that is um, why, that's why I spend a lot of time on measurement. And you might think it's overkill because we're going to spend a couple weeks on just talking about how to deal with uncertainty and measurement and stuff like that. Your first lab, we're going to do a lab next week. It's going to be all about this. You're going to be learning how to use this plus or minus notation to help you draw conclusions. OK, um, any, any questions before we move on? If you go to, on, on the Moodle site, go to this right here. It's, it's under this week. It says, know this, the SI system. Uh-oh. I'll just go in as a guest. Oh, I've already got it open. Sorry. This is what you'll see. And uh, this is a, I, I made this thing because I wanted to let you know the specifically what you need to know, what you need to have memorized in terms of units. And I know you've, you've, had the, you've been taught the SI system or the metric system um, so much that it probably makes you sick and very bored at this point. But that doesn't mean that you know it. So we need to make sure that, that you do, or you need to make sure that you do. And here's what you need to know. These are the basic uh, units for the different things we're going to be measuring, length and, 
and mass and all that stuff, and you probably all know that. What's, I'm guessing some of you are still a little shaky on this, though, the prefixes. So this is something you're going to want to memorize. And what I've done is put a subset of prefixes up here so that you can see exactly what I'm thinking is important. The cool thing about SI system is that you can just build any unit you want by putting the prefix together with the base unit so that a microgram is 10 to the minus 6 grams and so on. So study this thing and make sure that you understand how to work with it. I put the decimal form here and the uh, exponential notation here. This little guy right here, by the way, some of you probably haven't seen before. This is called mu, and it's Greek letter. And it is uh, the reason they use that is because they already used m for milli. So they couldn't use m again for micro, so they used the Greek m. And that looks like kind of a U with a tail off the front. So you'll be seeing that a fair amount. It's called mu, and that is for micro, and it is one millionth. One one millionth, 10 to the minus 6. So take a look at this and spend some time. You know, I don't know how you best learn things like this. You can make flashcards. You could, uh, one teacher suggests that you know, maybe hang this on your refrigerator and just take a look at it every time you go to get a glass of milk or whatever. Whatever, whatever helps you to learn it. You know, doing some practice problems, we'll, we'll have some. There's a few problems down here for you to uh, try doing some conversions. I just want to show you quick on the back side of this, there is the full list of prefixes. This goes up to 10 to the 24th, which is coincidentally as high as that video went, right, with the scale of the universe. It goes down quite a bit lower than, than that video went. This is out of date because just recently they came up with one for 10 to the 27th that the standards committee or whatever agreed on. Does anyone know what it is? 10 to the 27th? No? I believe it's Hella, H-E-L-L-A. And these, this one was just a joke. It's, it's not Lada. And ten, it's not lower than this is not Nada. Those are just jokes. But there is one, I think they recently, like last year, uh, started talking about Hella as being 10 to the 27th. They need these larger numbers. One of the reasons is, if you look at, um, like, computing speeds, for example, the speed of a computer increases exponentially over time. It doubles every 18 months. So what's been happening is that, you know, years ago, the fastest computers were in, like, what they, call, what they would call the gigaflops range. Flops is similar to... Uh, Similar to hertz, it's a little bit different, like gigahertz, whatever. And they have computers now that are pushing, that are, that are talking about, I think the fastest one now is, is a supercomputer in China that is 33 petaflops in speed. And uh, that, might, that probably means nothing to you, but my point is that soon they'll be in the exaflop range. A few years. And then after that, I mean, it's just, it's doubling every time. Within a decade or so, they will have computers that are able to match the speed of the human brain, even in similar processes. So that, that's why, my point is, why do they keep needing to add levels? Because things are just getting faster, getting more things, right? So they need to start using these higher higher numbers. In this class, we'll be using a number of 10 to the 23rd power, a fair amount. What's that related to? 10 to the 23rd power. Somebody knows. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Did you ever hear that number? That is called a mole, and it tells you, like, it's talking about how many atoms are in a certain mass of something. That's how many atoms are in 12 grams of carbon, for example. 10 to the 23rd power. So we'll be dealing with a lot of big numbers like this, which is why, and we didn't really get to it today, but uh, which is why we use scientific notation. Because 
when you're talking about numbers this large, if you're dealing with something like this, which is the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon, you don't want to have to write that out. You don't want to have to type it into your calculator, 23 zeros, every time you want to do a calculation. Right? Pretty obvious. So that's why we use scientific notation, but you need to be comfortable with, with that. Things like adding and subtracting in scientific notation. Let's say I wanted to do this. What's the answer to that? Eric. Five times ten to the first. Is that right? Anybody chime in? Okay, we got one second. All in favor? Don't know. Do I need to make sure that they're both in the same power of 10 before I add or subtract? So what if we do that? Let's take and put them both in terms of 10 to the 23rd. Remember, we got a multiplication in this thing here, times 10 to the 23rd. It's like trying to add 5a to 4b. 5a plus 4b, right? You got to have them both in terms of the same power of 10. So what's this going to be in 10 to the 23rd? 1.022 times 10 to the 22nd, 22nd is what times 10 to the 23rd? Eric. Zero point one zero two two. Now we can subtract, right? And we get what? What do we get? Who's got a calculator? Or who can do it in their head? Go ahead. What do we get? Five point nine times ten to the twenty third. Is that right? You guys have done sign of notation before, right? In math? No? Yes, no. Raise your hand. Did you do sign of notation in math class? Not recently? So are you talking about like middle school? Yeah? So this would be like some kind of pre-algebra or something like that? Sixth grade math? Okay, so, so we'll... So that's going to be important to review, I guess, right? And I got, I think what we'll do on Monday then is we'll um, spend some time reviewing. Scientific notation. Hmm. Okay, but no, this is, uh, this is the way to do it, folks, right here on the right. You got to put everything in the same terms. It's just like I said, if you got 4a and plus 5b, you've got to express them both in terms of the same variable before you can add them. So you're going to convert them both into 10 to the 23rd and then work from there.